Good afternoon, I'm Dennis Galecki, and welcome to the 438th Imagine Greater Buffalo program and our 60th virtual Imagine lecture hosted by our wonderful Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thanks so much for joining us today as we celebrate Native American Heritage Month. This program is created by the Center for the Study of Art, Architecture, History and Nature, or Cezanne, as I call it, and imaginelifelonglearning.com. Now, we're going to start with our speakers shortly, but first, a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded. You'll be able to watch it again later on the Downtown Central Library's Facebook page and YouTube channels. And we hope you share the link with your friends and networks. Now, our featured speaker today is Michael Martin. Michael is an Onondaga of the Beaver Clan from the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory in Southern Ontario, but was born and raised in Buffalo, New York currently resides in North Tonawanda. In February of 2004, he was named the Executive Director of Native American Community Services of Erie and Niagara Counties. After having served in an interim capacity since July of 2003. In 2016, he was named by his clan mother as a faith keeper for his Onondaga Beaver Clan and was formally acknowledged with his chief by the Haudenosaunee Confederacy in June of 2018. Let's hear more about all of this background and welcome Michael Martin. Michael, take it away. Uh, thank you, Dennis and uh, Melissa for the uh, kind introductions. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and share with you a little bit uh, of, uh, in the brief time we have together a little bit about our work at Native American Community Services and a, a little bit about our, our Haudenosaunee Confederacy and, and a lot of you know, centering around this, our, our concept or perspective of having what we call Ganaquillo or Ganagohillo, a good mind. And it's a, uh, it's a personal power, but it's also a collective power uh, when we uh, fully work with that. So over the next a few minutes, we'll share a little bit. And obviously in the time we have, I don't have time to get in depth of thousands of years of teachings and uh, you know, um, uh, history and all of that. But hopefully I'll leave you with enough just to kind of spark your interest. And we're, we're hoping to leave some time for questions and answers at the end as well, if you find a topic that you wanna dig deeper into. So again, thank you. It's, a, it's an honor to be here uh, today and looking forward to our discussion. So just a little bit about Native American Community Services. We were founded in 1975. Originally, as a, uh, an organization to serve the unemployment needs of the bu uh, local Buffalo Native American community. And although we uh, found that we had issues with alcohol and substance abuse in those early years, and obviously that's a barrier to employment or retaining employment, that we had to address that. So we've expanded uh, to then look into those areas. And when you get into di people dealing with alcohol or substance abuse issues and they have a family attached to them, and then you get into issues around like domestic violence and child welfare and uh, things of that nature that we, uh, ever since that beginning have been, as we discover needs, trying to address them. And although we, we still to this day target the off nation territory uh, population in, in Buffalo and Erie, which was where we were founded, we've now also expanded, uh, but all of our programs are open to, all but one really are open to and utilized by all facets of the community, both native and non-native alike. And uh, I like to think of us as a key human service provider to the whole community. Um, we currently have offices, our main offices is in Buffalo where we're headquartered, uh, but we also have offices in Niagara Falls and Lockport in Niagara County. And as I said, we just recently expanded to take on an additional 15 counties in upstate New York, and we'll be uh, adding offices soon in Rochester and Syracuse. And our aim is through our tradition of caring is to help all lives that come into our care to strengthen mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, and spiritually, while also building a greater sense of community. And it's certainly our belief that a healthy and thriving Native American population contributes to the vibrancy of the whole Buffalo and Niagara region and really now beyond as we start to work with broader territories of upstate New York. Uh, we have 10 different program areas. 
Um, and within each of these program areas are, are usually multiple programs. I think we have 28 total programs, uh, but organized in these 10 areas. We do a lot with adolescent pregnancy prevention. Uh, we have community and cultural services, economic empowerment and educational achievement, uh, family preservation and strengthening, trying to keep our families together that may be at risk of separation. Unfortunately, when they are separated, we also uh, thankfully though have foster care to support uh, families in need. And then uh, our health and wellness uh, and managed care services, as well as we have a focus on youth our elders are actually within our community cultural services because not only are they in need of assistance, but they're also a community asset for us as well. And then we have another area called special initiatives, which really is anything that doesn't fall into the other 10 areas. But it's also where we have our all the relations program, which uh, helps to provide cultural competency to different organizations and groups, whether it's school districts, health, uh, government businesses. Uh, so if interested, we can always do uh, different programming. Uh, that we have available in the community or different group settings. And it's also in the special initiative where we have our Gathering of Good Minds, which is an initiative uh, across uh, New York State uh, involving Native communities, uh, both on territory and off, that uh, are coming together to help uh, further these teachings of the good mind. And we'll come back to this image on the screen here. It's a picture taken outside my plane window when I had a early morning flight into New York City one day with the beautiful cloud deck and the sun starting to rise. Um, but the whole idea of the good mind is not that it's nice thoughts or attitudes, but it also is supposed to impact on our actions and behaviors. And the, 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 this whole concept of good mindedness that we started with the Gathering Good Minds is actually a large part of what the work we do at Native American Community Services in one way or another, really across all of our programs. And in our own community, we realized we had to help our community to understand and better live with good mindedness. And uh, because we were saying use a good mind and a lot of people were saying they were, but it wasn't maybe evidenced by not just their thoughts and attitudes, but their actions and behaviors. And so the, the idea that I had, it's like, well, if you tell your kid to be good and they shake their head yes and they go out the door, uh, if you don't explain what being good means, they can never really live up to that expectation. So it was the same thing in our community is that you know we were telling people to use a good mind, but we weren't, we weren't really properly training people to the depth of what that means. So they really couldn't live up to that expectation. And so that's what we're trying to uncover. And just like when you tell your kid to be good, they could be, they think they're doing good, but they could be doing the direct opposite of what you meant when you said that. Um, uh, and that's the same thing within our community too. So we're trying to unwind uh, why people aren't using a good mind. And so collectively we developed a four phase process to help more people live with good mindedness. And to me, it's a universal teaching. I think if you sat through our, 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 our four phase program, you'll probably would find uh, um, things that connect back to uh, things you were taught or things through your culture or your religion or your heritage um, that would resonate. So I, I really believe at its core, and I'll tell you why in a few minutes, uh, why this good mind teachings is uh, really, I think, universal. But it's our way of telling the story. So we spend a lot of time talking about these four phases. The first phase is helping our community and others to understand the cultural foundations and traditional teachings of the good mind. Um, and that's where we understand its concept and its intent. And then the second phase is helping people understand that the opposite of a good mind isn't a bad or evil mind. It's what we call a clouded mind. And helping them to understand things that can cloud their mind is a way to unwind and understand why people aren't using the good mind. And the third phase is once you understand your mind's clouded, how do you restore your good mind to rise above or remove those clouds so that you can get the full benefit of good mindedness? And then the fourth phase, which is usually the hardest, is maintaining the good mind. Once you restore your good mind, how do you maintain it on a daily basis? And that's really, really becomes a discipline. But the ultimate benefit of good minds coming together is the development of positive, sustainable solutions for all. And so we spend a lot of time in our, our, our workshop. Our overview is just three hours, let alone the full depth of it, uh, trying to help people understand it. One of the biggest concepts in the traditional teachings is living with the perspective of gratitude and abundance. And we do what we call a gononio or a Thanksgiving address. Or it's also referred to as words that come before all else to acknowledge all the gifts of creation. I, it's probably hard for you to see on your screens, but this is just one version. There's not really an official version uh, you, we're, we're taught through an oral tradition, but they do have similar uh, uh, themes throughout that are consistent. It's just maybe some people, the speaker will put it into a different maybe order. Uh, I was always taught, you know, you start with the people and you give thanks to the people. 
uh, even you on the, the that are watching and Zoom that we give thanks that you're healthy and well and be able to be here with us. Uh, we'll give thanks to all the elements of including Mother Earth and the waters and fishes in those waters. And again, we're acknowledging these gifts of creation that were intended to keep us healthy and well. Water's life. You know, we you can only go so long without water. Uh, it'll start to dehydrate. It starts to affect you mentally and physically. And if you go too long without water, you'll die. It's a fragile gift. And that's why you'll see indigenous peoples across the world and others standing up to protect waters uh, from having pipelines put across them, things that can endanger the water, not just for us as human beings, but for the plant life and the animals that also sustain. Wherever you find water, you'll find life. And, and that's no truer than just this planet that we live on. Um, they're looking through the vastness of the universe, trying to find another rocky planet that has water that can sustain life as we know it. And at least as far as I know, they haven't found it yet. So it shows you how fragile a gift it is. And that's why we give thanks. So we always keep that in mind. And we'll go on to give thanks to the plant life, the medicine plants, our food plants, the animals, the trees, the birds, the four winds, what we call our grandfathers, the thunders, our oldest brother, the sun, our grandmother, moon. Those are all family relationships born out of our creation story. And we'll give thanks to the, the stars and what we call enlightened teachers, our four spirit guides and protectors. And finally, we give thanks to who we call so our creator for all of these gifts of creation, all of these things intended to keep us healthy and well, even in going back to the trees. If you pass a tree, but a lot of people don't pay any mind or attention to it. But again, without those trees taking the CO2, we breathe, turning it back into oxygen. We can't live on the planet. And these fragile gifts, we always got to hold in the highest of gratitude in our minds because they allow us to live and be healthy and well. And so we'll, we usually there's some closing words that are also said, and then you'll hear the words like Donato which means we're, we're, we're done with that and we can go on with whatever function we have, whether it's a business meeting, a social event, whenever people gather, we wanna ground ourselves in good mindedness. And this is to make a shared safe space. And this is what this Thanksgiving address does for us. So it's not supposed to be just a nice thought or attitude. It is supposed to get into our actions and behaviors. And like I said, it's the foundation of good mindedness, but it's also you know this perspective of, uh, of living in gratitude and abundance humbles us and grounds us. And, allows us to live in balance and harmony with all because gratitude is a pathway to happiness because if at the end of the day, you really think about all of your day, the fact that you got up this morning and were able to open your eyes and take a breath that you were given the gift of another day of life on this earth, what a fragile gift that is. Unfortunately, we get reminded of that too much with the pandemic going on, but you have that gift of another day and amazing things can happen in just one day, but it's what you make of it. And it was chilly this morning. So maybe you had blankets on you or things to keep you warm, a roof over your head. Maybe you had food available for you to eat. You know, you have people who have love, care, and concern for you. Um, and unfortunately, there's too many across all of the society that go without those very basics of life, right? Go without shelter, go without warmth, go without food. So the fact that you have those already, you can start to see yourself in abundance. Like you have your needs being taken care of. And you can go through your whole day of meeting new people. Maybe it's kissing your your child before you put them on the bus or your spouse before you left for work or hearing a song that reminds you of somebody that uh, is important to you that's maybe no longer near whether they live far away or maybe passed on but you can also think of uh, learning new information or meeting making new uh, friendships or relationships and uh, you go throughout your whole day and and give thanks for all those wonderful gifts on top of all these gifts of creation and you really see how fortunate you are and, um, you know, it's a, it's a way to reset your priorities, too, because, yes, you might not have the biggest screen TV, the newest car, the fanciest clothes or newest shoes or handbag or whatever. But you have those basic things that you need to live a healthy and good life. And that's where it helps to reground us and center us on those very important things. And then uh, this, this idea of abundance, like there's enough for everybody, is a pathway to peace, because if there's enough, then I don't have to fight you over it. You know, we can actually get all of our needs met. And this idea of appreciation is a pathway to respect and honor, because this is where it starts to pivot into not just thoughts and attitudes, but actions and behaviors. And just like when we're taught to go pick our traditional medicines, like usually plants, you know, out in the woods or wherever we may be gathering, we're taught not to pick the first one we see. We stop and we give thanks to it that it's still there doing the job intended. And if we have a little of our traditional tobacco, we'll lay it down and give those words of thanks. And then we'll go on and pick the others. And what happens is if we were all in the same wooded area looking for that one medicine and there was no more left of it except that one, we should all end up gathered around it and giving like, did you see any more? Did you see any? And if the answer is no, then we know we have to nurture this one. Not only that it's there for us, 
but our future generations as well. So that's why living in that idea of appreciation uh, leads to that respect and honor, which then affects our, our not just thoughts and attitudes, like I said, it, it gets into our actions and behaviors. And contrast that to somebody who doesn't have that perspective and they just take the first one they see and that that's the only one, it may be lost forever. And so we live in this gratitude and a perspective through all of the year, all of our ceremonial cycles are really about gathering and giving thanks for things happening throughout the year. And we give thanks to the things we want to continue. The only time we don't give thanks as Haudenosaunee people is when there's death, because we don't want more of it. But we feel if we express our gratitude, you know, uh, through the natural world and through the, the vibrations and beats of our hearts and our good thoughts, and that energy gets out there and that's reciprocated back by those things still continuing for us. And like I said, we don't have time to get through everything, but I did want to mention that we do have a creation story that helps to define these relationships between human beings and the natural world. And in this creation story, we were given what we call original instructions, including to live in that perspective of gratitude and abundance. And so uh, we use that. And in our creation, all human beings came from the same creation. And so we would have all got those same original instructions before we were sent off in four directions. And there's a prophecy that we're going to have to come back together as human beings to share what we learned on those journeys uh, for the sake of continuing our humanity. So it's really a call back to bring us back to those original instructions. And so, oh, I'm going the wrong way in my slides here. <laughs> and then uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the other key element of our some of our traditional teachings, and there's many, I didn't have time to get through all of them, but one key one is our great law of peace, uh, where we had a peacemaker come to us after uh, we, lo we lose sight of those original instructions. We get these messengers that come back and remind us. And at the time our peacemaker came, it was a very dark time for people, a lot of killing, death, and bloodshed, and even stories of cannibalism. And this peacemaker brought back this concept of good mindedness and reminding us of how we're supposed to be uh, with each other as a way to develop peace, power, and righteousness. And peace, you can describe as balance and harmony within yourself, balance and harmony with each other, and balance and harmony with the natural world. Power is really not like it's often defined today as like a control or advantage over another. Power to us was the power of the collective, the power and unity uh, of coming together. And this righteousness is really this good mindedness. So it's often said this way that the great law helped to define peace, power, and righteousness. But I like to say it the opposite way is to me, it starts and ends with good mindedness. That's an individual and collective power that helps us to achieve peace. And one of the ways that our peacemaker demonstrated that is he went to each of our villages and he went and identified the strongest warrior in each village and gave him an arrow and asked him to break it. And of course, after a little bit of effort, that warrior was able to break it. And then he bundled five arrows together to signify the original five nations of our confederacy coming together, gave it right back to that warrior and he couldn't break it. And this simple act demonstrated when bonded together in good mindedness, we're stronger together than we are apart. And so that unified our original five nations, which were the Seneca, Cayugas, Onondagas, Oneidas, and Mohawks. And that's a long story, but it's also there's a lot of teachings within it that we don't have time to get today. But you might see this on a bumper sticker or as a flag is a representative of our Confederacy uh, coming together. And this you can overlay on a map of New York State with the keepers of the Western door, the Senecas, and the keepers of the Eastern door, the Mohawks. But you can see at both ends, the doorways are open, meaning other nations were able to come and accept our great law of peace and become part of our Confederacy. And so far, the only other nation to do so was the Tuscarora Nation that came up in the 1700s from which present day North Carolina. They originally were up in our area, moved down to present day North Carolina, and after war and other issues, walked back up and uh, joined uh, our Confederacy to become the Six Nations. And that's how often people will hear of us as the Six Nations or the Iroquois Confederacy, as the French called us. And so we take all these teachings and we have a holistic uh, perspective. Uh, that comes together across these multiple dimensions. And we have these principles that we use of, of using good mindedness, using encouragement, empowerment, using soft words, uh, all, all of these different uh, elements and principles that we use to uphold these ideas of good mindedness. And so people ask us, wow, you got such a beauty and power perspective in your teachings. And why are Native Americans sometimes disproportionate in a whole host and issues of negative health issues and outcomes? And it's not because of who we are, it's because of what we became. And that's where we start talking about trauma-informed care, where they used to say, tell me you know, what's wrong with you. Now we say, it's what happened to you, because we all have a story. And um, unfortunately, many 
uh, societies and people have experienced trauma either firsthand or intergenerationally. And so it's really about understanding the story of how we became to be so we can unwind that going forward. And that's where we get into this concept of understanding the clouded mind, where I take you back to this picture, because the clouded mind, sometimes clouds come into our minds and they're temporary. Like if you get hungry, they say you get hangry. If you don't get enough sleep and you're tired, you get a little irritable, or maybe you, you're listening, you have to go to the bathroom, you know what, I'm gonna stop talking so you can go. But those are sometimes like clouds passing in a day, they're temporary. If you're hungry, eat, tired, sleep, you have to go to the bathroom, please take care of your needs. But sometimes the clouds are a little bit deeper and heavier and thicker and last a little bit longer. Issues like hurt, anger, grief, fear, jealousy, greed, drugs, alcohol, desire, control, judgment, shame, all of those things can cloud our minds at a little bit thicker level. And just like you know, we have here in the Northeast, when you don't get the benefits of the sun, because to me in this analogy, the sun's like our good mindedness. It's always there to help us. But sometimes when we get clouds, we don't get that benefit and it starts to affect us at a deeper level, just like uh, 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 the medical diagnosis of seasonal affective disorder. When we have these gray upon gray days over winter and we don't have that benefit of sun, it starts to affect us mentally, emotionally, physically, and even spiritually, people get depressed and they have to do all of this remediation uh, to uh, correct that. And it's the same thing with our good mindedness. When we're dealing with deeper issues, we have to do a lot to correct it. And so we have all kinds of issues that have impacted upon our people uh, from the Doctrine of Discovery, the Clinton Sullivan campaign, uh, residential and boarding schools, which is a big aspect of our intergenerational trauma and other things that, can, that have traumatized us or continue. I would encourage you to go watch this video, Doctrine of Discovery, Unmasking the Domination Code. It's based on a book by Stephen Newcomb called Pagans in the Promised Land and the access through 38plus2productions.com. It's uh, about an hour long, but it's a fascinating look at the impact and lasting impact of the doctrine of discovery of how uh, European nations came in and basically uh, because we were unchristianized that we're able to do all these brutal and, and unhumane things to us in the sake of getting these resources. And then uh, we did a video a documentary in 2009 called Unseen Tears that looked at the impact of Native American residential boarding schools right here in Western New York focused on the Thomas Indian School, which is in the Seneca Territory, about 45 minutes south of Buffalo, and what was called the Mushroll or Mohawk Institute, which is, again, in Brantford, just outside the Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, about an hour and a half west of Buffalo, where, like, my family and uh, many other families came to the Buffalo area uh, for work and other opportunities generations ago that are impacted still by these uh, unfortunate legacies. And so at Max, we're trying to move from being really good survivors. Our Native people are very resilient either we survived a lot of trauma and we often hear that trauma is woven into our DNA, but we're here to remind our native people, don't ever forget the strength and resiliency of our ancestors is too. And so at Max, we're trying to move our people from being good survivors back to thriving as we once were uh, before all these traumas. And that's where we get into our healing and other practices. And if we had a time in the exercise, we would ask you where you get your medicine. When we talk about medicine, it's the things that bring you back to balance and harmony. And so what are the people, things, or activities that help bring you back to dance and harmony? Because those are also the things that you should be giving thanks for on a daily basis to let that, those medicines know, even if it's, even if it's just put, sitting by the water or, or hearing the birds or talking to people, letting them know how much you mean to them because we know life's a fragile gift. And that's one of the regrets we can have as human beings is losing somebody who was a good teacher or supporter who really helped us, cared for us, loved us. And we lose them without really fully expressing that. And you never know when those days are gonna come, but you don't have to wait for a special moment. That's a big regret we can have as humans, not sharing that, but you can do that any day. And whenever you think of somebody, it's important to kind of reach out and let them know, or take the time and not wait just for special birthdays or anniversaries or uh, special events to acknowledge and give thanks for your medicines that you have in your life. And so we talk about how everything we're supposed to do as Haudenosaunee people, we're taught that we, every action decision we make, we have to be mindful of the seven generations in the head because it's our responsibility to ensure their well-being. just as we can look back seven generations to those that came before us and left us the, what, what they could uh, so we could be not only be here to survive, but also to eventually get back to prospering and being thriving again. And so that's hard to think ahead to your great, 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 great grandchildren, I always got to read it off the slide, just as it's hard to think back to your great, 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 great grandparents. And so we tell our, our community and our clients, think of it as a smaller microcosm of those seven generations. 
yourself as one generation and then look back to your parents and grandparents. And if you're so lucky enough to have met your great grandparents and give thanks for the gifts they left you, but also understand some of the trauma they endured and why maybe you are the way you are, why things are the way you are or, or the, the way they are and what you can change or what you might not be able to change. But then think forward three generations, completing the seven to your children, grandchildren, if you're so lucky enough to meet your great grandchildren and what is the legacy you wanna leave for them. And that's what drives our, our actions and decisions or should drive our actions or decisions as we look back and forward. And um, individually, your good mindedness, you have an impact yourself uh, with your own good mind. It's like, if you see a water drop, I always use the analogy of a water drop. If you see it up close, hit a ground, it'll make a little indentation, a little vibration in the earth. Or if you see a, a drop of water into a body of water, you see that ripple effect. That's the impact of your individual good mindedness. But when we pull together our good minds in a collective effort and we move in the same direction, like a body of water, we become a very powerful force of change. Just like the waters that carved out the Grand Canyon or the waters that, that carved out Niagara Falls just down the road. Um, and so collectively moving in the same direction, we become a very powerful force of change when we bring our good minds together. And so we have a whole nother workshop on aligning spirit and intent where we kind of bring all these concepts together, but it's really about connecting at the very basic human level of aligning our spirit and intent so that we can make the most of our good mindedness to help each other and to have our, our best of intentions really be felt. And that is where we want to focus on is our common humanity. You know, wherever we are in the world, we all as human beings have the same basic needs, right? We need clean water to drink. We need food to eat. We need warmth and shelter when we're cold. We all want a sense of belonging, you know, and, you know, we all smile in the same language. And so no matter where we are as human beings, it's important that we focus on more than those, of those things that we have in common that our humanity needs to survive and to focus and rally our efforts around that of coming together. And so that's a lot of the work that we do as NACS of helping our community to do that. But we also do these workshops outside of NACS to help the non-native population understand some of these concepts. And like I said, these are universal teachings and to me in the end and help find their own path to their own story, understanding the trauma they endured and their ancestors endured, but really focusing on how we come back, come back to that collective common humanity to find a better way forward for all, to put our good minds together and see what we can make for our future seven generations together. And so I wanna say, you know, I know I'm kind of rushing through because of time here, uh, but uh, thank you for this opportunity. And I'll leave my contact information up. If you have questions we're not gonna be able to get to maybe or uh, other comments, feel free to reach out. I'll be happy to take them offline. So I'm gonna end there and turn it back uh, to Dennis and just saying now we go up for the opportunity to share. Michael, thank you very much for uh, uh, a real quick journey, uh, both to our past and uh, the term seems to be used now of well-being. Uh, uh, it captures, uh, more than just health, it, it, uh, uh, it, it's the whole mind, body, spirit. Uh, and it's just rooted in your, in the culture that you grew up in. Uh, quick question, uh, do you get many people that are non-Native Americans uh, to the workshops that you present? Uh, uh, are, are they known to be available out in the community or is it exclusive for Native American uh, uh, Folks, we do some initiatives that are exclusive for the native community, but a lot of most of our workshops are open and attended well attended by the non native community as well. And our Facebook page has a listing of events that we do as well as other organizations do that can be attended by the community. We have a an, it's being Native American Heritage Month. We're partnering with the Niagara Arts and Cultural Center for a big event uh, sharing some of our culture and arts uh, November 20th and 21st up at the Niagara Arts and Cultural Center in Niagara Falls. That's free and open to the public. There's workshops people can sign up for there. Uh, we have a keynote speaker that's gonna share some more of information on some of the same topics I talked about. And we do workshops that get into depth on every little thing that I said and more. So feel free to check out our Facebook page and, and welcome to attend. We'd love to have uh, more people join us for sure. Michael, that sounds great. Melissa, do we have some questions from the audience? Um, it's not a question, but it's a comment, but perhaps it can spark some discussion here. Uh, actually, we have a few questions. <laughs> um, first comment is from Betty. This lecture is so beautiful. The issue is all do not live this way. I look at it as a compassionate religion, which we might all pay mind to. 
We must remember no one is perfect, but important to be trying to live this way. Well said, Betty. <laughs> and uh, then we have a question. This is Thomas O'Neill White from WBFO News, wondering if you could talk a little more about the impact of elders in the community. The impact of elders? Well, they're like living libraries, you know. Uh, they have the great, we, we respect them because they have the longest life experience. Uh, they, they have a lot of stories that they've learned and shared. So they're like our teachers, our, 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 our repositories of knowledge. And when the pandemic hit, and we lost some of our, our great leadership of our elders. It was devastating. It's like losing the library. So it's like losing the, the Buffalo and Erie County Library, that knowledge base that can, is contained in, in a conduit of information that's shared into the community. That's what each other feels like to us. And so we uplift them and we hold them in high regard. And, you know, they also need support and care and we provide that as well. Um, but um, yeah, the impact that we have an elders council that we use to, to help guide both the, the advisory to our board and to our organization, but to be community role models as well uh, that are respected for their community history knowledge or their, their knowledge of our traditional teachings. And so, uh, but elders across the, the board are, are respected for, you know, just that they've endured and survived. And we, we, they, they have uh, had to go through a lot for us to be here and we appreciate them greatly. And uh, another question. So you showed the seven generations. Why, why is it seven generations? What is the significance of this? Of you know, why does it go back that far, or why doesn't it go back further? I guess either way. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if um, uh, maybe that's the 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 manageable. You know, I actually I'm gonna have to go. I never got asked that, and <laughs> I never asked that. That's just always what we've been taught. So we didn't ever I never questioned why it's seven versus eight or six or something like that. But I think it's a long enough of a time frame that goes beyond sometimes the, the, the thought process, but not going too far that it's even harder to imagine. Because literally our councils, our traditional councils of chiefs, when they gather, they literally do sit there and try to think of uh, one simple uh, uh, issue that may be come from before them, like what impact that's going to be that far out. You know, that makes them have to work through all kinds of scenarios. So even if just, if you try that individually as an exercise, like what you eat, like what you're gonna go get, like, are you gonna buy something that's in a bag? Like, what's the bag made of? What's gonna happen with that bag? What's the company that you're buying that from? And what's that, what are they gonna do with money? How responsible are they? What's the nutritional time? Like there's so much that goes into simple decision and that's the responsibility they have. I do know like the Maoris in New Zealand, they have like a 500 year uh, planning cycle or something uh, enormous like that, where they're really trying to think farther ahead in advance. But I think seven works because it's far enough out that it, it, it does make us have to work a little harder, but enough that it makes it realistic as well. I mean, because if you can just look at the seven in that microcosm I said, of looking back three and looking forward three, you can see that that seven's not that far away from us at any given time. Uh, Melissa, let me, just, question. let me just throw out a, a stab, certainly not based on Native American experience, uh, although if you go to the Smithsonian uh, website on uh, the Native American uh, Museum that they have, uh, I think you'll get more clarification on seventh generation thinking. But seven, uh, and I'm thinking from a Christian standpoint, uh, we're told to forgive uh, sin seven times 77. I mean, it's, it's like an infinite number. It, it, uh, we have seven days in the week. There's a there's something about the the number seven that is uh, uh, has some much deeper not meanings than just a number. If that's like that, I'm re I'm really curious of interfaith work because, like I said, in our thinking, we all all humans came from the same creation. We all got those original instructions. So I'm always curious to see how those original instructions get played out in different religions and cultures uh, across the world because we've all gotten messengers too to reinforce. The good mind, just like we got the peacemaker, other cultures and religions got messengers as well to try to bring them back to the same original instruction. Michael, we could uh, spend a great deal of time, and I just I hope we've whetted the appetite uh, in this special month uh, of November uh, as we approach gratitude uh, in the Thanksgiving holiday, and uh, and the, the the meals we'll share together with family and friends. Uh, uh, so you gave us a, a, a 
wonderful uh, walkthrough of a way of life, literally a way of life and an appreciation of the Native American culture that is, I would argue, uh, you know, at our roots. Uh, and certainly if you go to that Smithsonian site, you'll see how constitutions uh, were modeled in some way after the Iroquois Confederation, as the French called it, as you say. Yeah. And um, uh, it, it's, it's, it's good study. So uh, we thank you very much, uh, Michael, for joining us today and uh, 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 hope that this is a, a, a nice segue into next week's presentation by Joe Stallman. Uh, he's at the uh, uh, Seneca Museum uh, in Salamanca, uh, the Seneca Iroquois National Museum in Salamanca. Uh, he's the executive director, and he'll be joining us next Tuesday. Uh, so uh, please join us, folks, if you can. Uh, tell others about this. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for supporting this program. I'm Dennis Galecki. Be well and have a good day. <laughs>